Good evening, welcome. I'm Terry McCarthy. I'm president of the Academy. Thank you for all jo joining us for the last of our fellows' presentations before Christmas, and the last of this semester. Um, delighted to have our trustee with us, Volker Schlendorf. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. I hope you like our tree outside and the Hanukkah candle next to it, so we're covering all bases. Um, our speaker tonight is our John P. Birkeland fellow, uh, Hans Sosi. Now, Hans is a polymath. He's uh, he teaches at the University of Chicago. I should say, since I come from LA, he's also been at UCLA and Stanford, but took the somewhat extraordinary decision to move to Chicago after all the nice weather in, in, in LA. But you know, who knows? From some people like that weather, I guess. Um, and probably feels quite at home in, in Berlin right now, I should think. Um, anyway, he's, he's, uh, he's now at University of Chicago. Uh, I should also tell you he was elected as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2009. Yeah, uh, which is, as you know, a great honor. And tonight he's going to talk about another world literature, which is going to take us to a different perspective of how we look about literature, to East Asia, and particularly China, which, of course, is uh, his major specialty. The other thing that's remarkable about Han is that even as he specialized in China, he did a degree in Greek, and he's managed to teach his kids. He's got three kids to how to speak German, just since he's lived, he lived here. Uh, most extraordinary uh, <laughs> efforts that have gone on here. So congratulations to that, and thank you so much for, for joining us all. Han, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Terry. I want to thank the, Ber the Birkeland family, um, the Academy staff who have been marvelous to us, the fellows, the partners. Um, this has been a marvelous experience, and as you know, it's probably, probably the, uh, it, well, it's our last public event of the semester, so. Uh, one always feels, you know, a little bit uh, the, the sad sense of closure. But before I begin, I want to say how marvelous and unusual this place is. Uh, Immanuel Kant described human beings as living in an ungeselige Geselligkeit, <laughs> an unsocial sociality. People are compelled to live together and they hate each other and they're always trying to undermine each other and destroy society. But here, somehow, at the Academy, we've discovered the opposite thing, a gesellige Ungeselligkeit, <laughs> where we're left alone to do the things that we want to do solitarily, uh, you know, scratching away at our manuscripts, and we come together with great happiness. We find each other at meal times, or we bump into each other on the pathways, and that, that somehow makes everything complete. So I, I think, um, I'm, I'm not usually somebody who thinks that he can speak for everybody, but I think I can speak for everybody in this instance and say that, that we're very grateful, all of us, for, for this opportunity that we've had. So, you might think that my fingers got a little bit heavy on the keyboard and I put the uh, slash between world and literature by mistake, but actually that's a kind of punctuation that I want to... Uh, to insert in the notion of world literature, to, to force you to pause a little bit between the words world and literature. And here's why. Or, well, not immediately here's why. First, uh, a story from social media and this crazy year, 2018. The Chi You might remember a few months ago that uh, in prom season, uh, in that ritual of adulthood, high school graduation, uh, there was a girl in Utah who bought in a second-hand store a dress that she thought was pretty and posted a picture of herself on social media, uh, being very happy about her, her Chinese dress, as she called it, and she was assailed by hundreds of people and then thousands of people and I think eventually hundreds of thousands of people for having performed an act of cultural appropriation. She was not Chinese and she was wearing a Chinese dress and that was bad. And one person in fact uh, was particularly aggressive and said, my culture is not your prom dress. <laughs> but look, you can see a little bit about the dress. Um, Something funny about that dress, right? Is it, in fact, a Chinese dress? Well, it's what in Chinese we call a qi pao, right? Qi meaning banner and pao meaning robe. <laughs> Put them together and you get qi pao, a banner robe, which means a Manchu robe. What kind of banner? Well, this kind of banner. 
The Manchus were organized in banners. People belonged to a unit of the heavily militarized Manchu society, and a banner was your social unit of about 10,000 people. And there were, I think, eight traditional banners, including several banners composed entirely of Chinese people who had rallied to the Manchu cause. So a qi is a very important thing. And to be a qi ren, to be a banner person, is also a kind of defining role in society. Here is a Manchu lady. Notice that she's wearing a high collar. Her, her uh, jacket has a split in it, and I think her, her dress, too, on the side has a split. That's because the Manchus were originally nomadic people. They rode horses. They were out in the cold. So you want a high collar. You want splits in your clothes so that you can get on and off a horse. If you're a Chinese person, and these are some people who insist on wearing traditional Chinese clothing instead of Western clothing or this kind of bastardized Manchu Chinese hybrid that we were seeing a moment ago, these are people who insist on wearing authentic Ming Dynasty clothing and make quite a big deal about it. Uh, if you look at the, at the Ming Dynasty clothing worn by these enthusiasts, you'll see that the collars are, are low and the skirts are not split. Okay, so the Qi Pao is not actually Chinese, except in a kind of a geographical sense, and there's still more to say about the geographical sense, too. So I wonder, if, if calling this, uh, this Manchu item Chinese isn't a case of cultural appropriation, then what is? My point here is not to play gotcha with the fault finders. That is too easy and would seem to put me in a position of moral superiority where I absolutely do not find my comfort. Rather, it is to ask, why do we forget about the Manchus? What lesson do the Manchus have to tell us, particularly in their situation of having been forgotten about? So, brief history lesson then, and forgive me if you remember this from school. The Qing or Manchu dynasty ruled China from 1644 to 1911. They were few in numbers, but well organized. You know, remember that banner. The revolution that toppled the Manchus in 1911 was led not mainly by ideals of democratic self-rule, but by ideals of ethnic self-rule, the goal of an end to the domination of Han Chinese by the descendants of northern nomad warriors. Once the Manchus' empire was over, they faded from the scene. No longer to exert any influence in Chinese politics and society, except as the puppets of one Japanese imperial project, the short-lived kingdom of Manchu Kuo, headed by the former last emperor of the Qing. And you'll remember, of course, the Bertolucci movie, The Last Emperor, that deals with, uh, with that emperor's story. Now, if you look at the map of China in 1911, that is, at the moment of the revolution that unseated the Manchus, you'll see several areas that later broke away, either permanently, as in the case of Outer Mongolia, that's the upper part of the blue here. Uh, they, uh, they became their own state in 1921 with a bit of uh, Soviet help, uh, or uh, temporarily, uh, as was the case for several other chunks of this map where people sort of declared their autonomous republic but then later rejoined China. Understandably, the prospect of living in a nation in which they would be foreigners, perhaps even second-class citizens, caused unease among Manchus, Mongolians, Turkestanis, and Tibetans whose bonds to China have never been entirely solid. There are historical reasons for this, and I'll get into some of them later. For now, the episode of the Twitter war about the Qi Pao gives me the opportunity to remind you that China, like many other countries, is multicultural, and to ask how culture and nationality interact there. Who is Chinese after all? And do they become Chinese through their own free will, or because other people ascribe to them that status? Let me change the perspective so that you can see why I think it's my business to be asking that question. So literature is much more my business than geopolitics. But you can't always separate the two. Goethe said in 1827, national literature does not mean so much today. The era of world literature has arrived. 
This famous sentence, spoken by an extremely well-informed man who had been one of the leaders of the national literature movement in Germany in the previous years, has rung down the centuries and inspired a small scholarly industry. What is this world literature? What works are included in it? Is it a selection of the best works, the most universal, the most worthy of imitation, or is it a comprehensive catalog of all the writing that has been written down around the world? How do you find your way around it? In my country, and many other countries where the syllabus of literary works assigned to students is mainly taken from our own nation and language, world literature has taken on the characteristics of a mission, the mission of broadening the horizons of Americans and showing them how much cultural diversity there is in the world. With such objectives, I cannot disagree. World literature should be the cosmopolitan answer to national literatures. But when you move to concrete descriptions and proposals in works of scholarship or pedagogy, the perspective is rather narrower than the word cosmopolitan would lead you to think. Scholars have produced, under the label world literature, histories of publishing that chronicle the rise to world fame of a few authors, typically European, through a process in which strenuous promotion plays its part. Pascal Casanova, for example, in The World Republic of Letters, tells that kind of story. Or we have histories of the world novel. We have histories of economic globalization lightly made over as cultural history. These histories typically start in 1492 with the exploration of the New World by Columbus. In other words, the culture they reflect is European, and their version of cosmopolitanism is the extension of European culture to new continents. Is part of the problem the fact that most of world literature will need to be translated and we don't have enough translators? Fine then, say some scholars, let's just concentrate on global Englishes. One argument against world literature blames it as a new mask of English language dominance and the commodification of culture. I somewhat agree with that, but I don't think that you can just refuse cosmopolitanism given that the people of the planet are bound to interact more and more, and we might as well take an interest in how they do so. While the tendency to Eurocentrism among advocates of world literature has not gone unnoticed, counterblasts have often been framed in the same terms. So we have efforts to build up a literary canon of the global south, a category that exists simply because of a polarity with the global north. To be absurdly brief about it, I would say that accounts of world literature typically begin when people think they know what the world is, always in the singular, right, the world, and that they know what literature is. I would like to frame a project that seeks to find out what they are instead, to find out what they have been or what they can be. So I, I take from the sociologist Niklas Luhmann the notion that a world is the available horizon of communication for the people who live in it. Thus, if there are intelligent beings on Mars, they are not yet part of our world, though they might one day become so. Many civilizations of the past that have left traces and objects for us to examine have not left us enough information about their ideas for, for them to become very much part of our world. A horizon of communication then implies shared information and some way of transmitting it. Literature intrinsically involves communication. Wherever you have writers and readers, you have the beginnings of a shared world. I think it's more promising to construct the world out of the literature than to start with a given world and see how literature behaves in it. Since there are many readerships, there must be many such worlds. In order to test these hypotheses, and in order to try to shake free from the European domination of the subject, I've decided to enlist a couple dozen well-informed colleagues in writing a literary history of East Asia before 1800 as an experiment in reconstructing another world, world's world literature. Here we are arguing about the table of contents. <laughs> before 1800, because after 1840 or so, the ever-increasing influence of Europeans complicates things in East Asia. The period we want to write about is a long one, reaching from the discovery of writing in East Asia in around 1500 BC to 1800. And it's a broad one, reaching from the Himalayas to the Mongolian <coughs> steppes, from the deserts of Central Asia to the tropical zones of Southeast Asia. No one person knows or can know everything that's relevant to this history. 
In a couple of big meetings so far, I've been trying to get people with specialist knowledge to write about such topics as the invention of the Tangut alphabet, Korean folk and court poetry, the nomadic Turks and their epic traditions, the merchant networks of the Sogdians. Sogdians are always a big deal. The role of the Tokharians in conveying Buddhism from its original home in India to the land of its greatest diffusion, namely China, and so forth. Not surprisingly, in our meetings we found that each specialist wanted to write about his or her special area of knowledge, leaving somebody else, presumably me, to put together the chronology and the geography for a series of probably six or seven volumes. My project here at the Academy has been to start work on a short book that will be the introduction to this literary history of East Asia, a kind of outline of the project and a polemic about literary history. Why a polemic? Well, this points to the necessity of the project. For every country we're contemplating surveying, there exist, of course, national literary histories. These are often marvelously done within the limits of that type of thing well-argued, well-documented, full of intelligent choices and judgments. But they have a common tendency to stress whatever features in the literary canon enable one to present Japanese, Korean, Chinese, etc. literature as an unbroken development from an unambiguous beginning to the present, espousing the contours and periodization of the conventional histories of that nation. Often it's involved with a construction of some kind of collective national personality. As a result, whatever came into the national literature, uh, literary heritage from outside, by the presence of minority groups, by domination and conquest, by translation, by conversion, by emulation, by misunderstanding, all that tends to be minimized, reduced to, at most, a fleeting and local role, sometimes just suppressed. Our project, then, by choosing not to replicate what already exists in the standard national histories, has a free hand to investigate every kind of transmission of ideas and works that has happened across borders or between different groups within the nations that are the protagonists of those national histories. I want us to recreate the multipolar conversations that occurred in the past before the nations we know today existed. I am sure some readers, if we eventually have readers, will be disturbed. But many others will, I hope, find in our account an enlargement of their understanding and an inspiration to break down monolithic monolingualism. And there, of course, is my secret agenda for monolithic monolingualism is a problem as well in the culture that I call home. So what have we found so far? I don't think this is just a feature of my own training as a China scholar, but rather a fact about East Asian literary exchanges. China is the main part, partner, the central participant in cross-border culture before 1800, though it does not engage in the same way with all participants. Many of the participating cultures are in contact with one another only through China rather than directly. The means of connection is most of the time through the Chinese written language. That writing system was, in almost all areas of the continent, the first one to be known and the one in which the history of many non-Chinese peoples was first written. Histories of Chinese literature nowadays usually include a chapter on Chinese writing outside China, Sino-Japanese, Sino-Korean, Sino-Vietnamese, and other traditions of literary composition where classical Chinese was used by people who did not speak Chinese on a daily basis. It was a common symbol set, coexisting with different vernaculars. The symbol set was only partially and tentatively aligned with the spoken languages. Yet the symbol set was self-sufficient as a language and gave entry into the great Chinese conversation. In that sense, the Chinese written language is cosmopolitan. It is bigger than the Chinese empire itself. And here's a, a very rough sketch map that, uh, that aims to remind you of the, uh, the extent of historical China through most of its empires in yellow, in, in red, Korea, in blue, Japan, in green, Vietnam. You can imagine a sort of an ambience of the Chinese character is enveloping all these places. Although, of course, people in every region of China pronounce the characters in their own ways, as did the Vietnamese, Koreans, and Japanese. Right? So that it, uh, it wasn't 
a common language in the sense of an Esperanto that people could use simply to speak to one another, but through writing, and specifically through classical writing, communication was possible. So think of this as a chart of the extension of the Chinese written language in an international field. Now, in, in anthologies of poetry and essays from dynastic China, we find compositions by Koreans, Japanese, and Vietnamese, some of whom even competed in the Chinese examination system and came away with official titles. There was, you could say, a republic of letters to which all were welcome, all men at least, if they had the re requisite education. But after some centuries of using Chinese for administrative, poetic, religious, and other elite forms of recording and communication, the countries that had adopted it then developed writing systems of their own. The Japanese developed hirakana and katakana, which they used side by side with Chinese. The Koreans invented two or three different phonetic writing forms before the writing system used today was promulgated by King Sejong in the 16th century. The Vietnamese devised a script using Chinese characters that was unreadable by Chinese, but reflected the pronunciation of their own language. Literary composition went on in these new writing systems. Very distinguished compositions, if you'll remember the tale of Genji and the Pillow Book, for example. But these works were never translated and read by the Chinese until the 20th century. Poems, essays, letters, and novels in classical or vernacular Chinese were quite enough for them. And, you know, it's a huge canon, right? There's no surprise that people were, were staying with, with their own canon. So although the Chinese character enabled communication with these countries, the communication was layered. There was one level specialized for certain types of writing where Chinese was de rigueur, and then there was a level where vernacular writing or a mix of vernacular and Chinese tended to be used. One of those mediums was an international means of communication, and the other was not. Here's a, a doodle to sketch how it works, right? You have over here the huge Chinese conversation, right? Uh, thousands of people writing busily away all the time. Through classical Chinese, you have a bridge to other cultures, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, which generate their own vernacular writing system that is not in communication with the big Chinese conversation, right? It's, it's specific to each of those nations. Okay. So, it's not enough then to call classical Chinese the Latin of the East, as some people have done, and to give it the status of a world language. For Chinese in the pre-modern world, it certainly was the world language, but there's a lot that passed them by. A lot that, that was part of the world, but not part of their world. We know the limits of their interest because we can see what was translated or adapted between which languages. Vietnamese, Japanese, and Koreans, for example, translated and adapted works of Chinese fiction into their own vernaculars. But the converse didn't happen. The limitation of classical Chinese as an international language was that the conversations it sparked were so often one way. The exception to, the, the exception to this rule, and the one great period of translation into Chinese, was the spread of Buddhism, a very complicated international story involving surprisingly little communication with India and a great deal of mediation through Central Asian peoples. And then there's, uh, there are the vast zones that were in contact with China for millennia but did not accept the Chinese char character and classical language texts. Let's call them, for simplicity, Zone C. Manchuria, Mongolia, Xinjiang, where the Uyghurs live, and Tibet. Right? These are, this is a zone under Chinese influence, but linguistically apart. It subdivides into different languages, each with its own alphabet. And different channels of circulation and translation were active. Tibetans translated texts from India not only the Buddhist doctrinal works that you might expect, but also epics and wisdom literature. For example, there was a Tibetan paraphrase of the Ramayana already in the 10th century. The Indian epics entered Chinese only in the 20th century. Speaking of epics, the very same zone where the Chinese character met with little favor is the zone of chanted poetic hero stories that go on for days and days. The Tibetan Gesar epic, the Kyrgyz epic of Manas, the Uyghur epic of Oghuz Khan, the Mongol Jangar epic, and their derivatives and analogs in Manchu, Ladakh, Tangut, and so forth are a still living art form, however much reduced. So 
you might think of those, uh, those four zones as being epic territory and China as being the territory where epic is of no interest at all. And what is, what is this epic thing in any case? Hold on, I've got something to show you here. Here is a, uh, a young Tibetan who has learned the Gesar epic, and I hope we can make him sing his piece. Here he goes. The Gesar epic, by the way, is 120 volumes in print. <coughs> Ya I imagine you've been many times the, the patient anthropologist sitting with a pen listening to, to these uh, performances. All right, so the, there's one of the living reciters of this epic, which uh, for, for many years during the Cultural Revolution was driven underground and uh, discouraged. Uh, it's, it's amazing that there are still people who know chunks of it by heart and, and can go on in these multi-day recitations. Well, in this Area C, let's see, let's go back to the, yeah, the Area C up, up at the top, the history of largely nomadic peoples had to be compiled on the basis of oral narratives that were written down in monasteries. This was important work. It could often resolve conflicting claims of kingship, genealogy, or land possession. It addressed familial, political, metaphysical, and logical questions, a bit like the Indian Mahabharata. None of this, however, found favor with the people who were writing in Chinese. It was too barbaric and too remote from the concerns of the urbanized, commercial, tightly administered Chinese empire. To write the literary history of this zone, then, is to talk about parallel channels, distinct conversations that, that meet only rarely and briefly. And this is where the Manchus come into the story again. For it is they who added to China the regions, amounting to, you know, something like a, a third or a half of the country today, despite losses, uh, those regions of the vast north and west. The Manchus could do this because they were not Chinese. They were adept channel switchers. Right, so if you, if you uh, look at this next map here, oh, there we go. Here's, here's a map that has some dates on it, not all of them accurate, but you know, enough to give you a basic idea. Right? Uh, if you look at this map, the most recently added zones, you know, inner, inner and Outer Mongolia, which were added by alliance already in the 17th century because the Manchus were kin to the Mongol ro royal families, royal lineages. Uh, Tibet, which was made a protectorate in 1721, a little bit, bit earlier than the 1751 that the mapmaker has written. And the uh, largely Muslim Uyghur province of Xinjiang, conquered in a series of wars between 1690 and 1760, these are also the zones where the Chinese character is not the traditional means of communication. The Mongol and Manchu language, languages have their own writing system, derived ultimately from Syrian. The Uyghurs have a version of Arabic script. 
the Tibetan script derives from Indian Devanagari characters. It was not in the long-established canons of Chinese empire to subdue people who wrote. People who wrote Chinese were already civilized and needed no subduing, and barbarians who needed subduing typically did not write. Zone C is the zone of exceptions. It's where China met other empires, Persian, Kuchan, Russian, and so forth. Now, script seems to matter quite a lot in this story. Uh, the Uyghur historian Kahar Bharat puts it rather sharply. Chinese characters, he says, were really what brought about the Han ethnicity. Without these characters, there would be no Han <laughs> ethnicity. The Han ethnicity really is just over a hundred peoples assimilated into one body. This process is still continuing. China had 56 ethnicities, by official count, when the country was founded. After the past 50 years, there's probably only six left. In fact, over half probably exist entirely in name only. Thus far, Kahar Bharat. As for those officially recognized 56 nationalities, you can see from these 1950s propaganda posters how they are imagined. As colorful people prone to song and dance, but passive observers of the wave of industrialization and modernization led by the Han Chinese majority. It is said that the Han account for 92% of China's population, which leaves 8% for the national minorities. Were it not for the Manchus, that figure would have been much smaller. Here's some more cheerful minorities doing their dances. Uh, this map shows the remaining linguistic diversity of China, where again it is Tibetan and Mongolian that cover the most area, with Miao, Yi, and Dai spoken in islands of the south, and Manchu and Korean far up in the north. Chinese remains the primary language of the huge territory that largely corresponds to the Ming Empire, that is, before 1644. Now, we say Han majority, but as, uh, as Kahar Bharat is uh, suggesting, Han ethnicity is itself the result of the assimilation of neighboring populations, at first rivals and enemies to those who identified as Chinese, who were absorbed into them through merger or conquest and eventually lost any distinctive features. We read in ancient Chinese texts about fearsome competitors, the Dongyi, Yue, Qiang, Jiang, and others. Those ancient people have certainly left descendants, but centuries of intermarriage and migration have erased any differences that might give rise to a sense of ethnic identity. The Uyghurs, Tibetans, Manchus, and Mongolians have been part of the Chinese national body, body for a far shorter time than the rest, just a few hundred years, as you saw from the map earlier. That accounts partly for their non-assimilation. And they have had centuries of independent written culture, those ethnicities that melted into the Han had no written culture of their own. Their history was written for them by outsiders. And so, to follow up on Kahar Bharat's remark, they had no defense against the assimilative power of the Chinese character. Today's China is a multicultural state, but one with the avowed aim of assimilating and normalizing the uh, national minorities or internal aliens. Everyone in China will respond when you mention the national minorities that the minorities in general are lovely people, spontaneous, generous, a bit too innocent perhaps, but the Tibetans and the Uyghurs, they're the headache, they're the standouts, the problem cases, the ones who just don't join in the great dance of nationality, waving their colorful costumes. For those people, culture is intimately political and they feel assimilation as a danger and a loss. Bharat's surmise about the letter suggests the answer to a question you may have been asking yourselves. What does literature have to do with all this? Why not frame this project as a study in anthropology, ethnic studies, religion, sociolinguistics, or population dynamics? Like other cultural forms, literary texts perform identity, but not just in the present. Script mm -hmm. confers command over one's cultural memory, to use the phrase launched by Jan Asman, and as such, outlasts genealogy, belief, architecture, cuisine, and even speech. Documents dealing with the past, written in an inherited script, confirm old ties, and as I've been finding again and again while writing this introduction, 
speak loudest when they don't speak of something, as when the Chinese literary tradition and the Central Asian epic tradition fail to cross paths with words or ideas. Who communicates with whom? Who reads, translates, writes to whom? Who learns whose written language? Who avoids whom? How are or aren't they part of a world? Now, as I've been saying, the multiculturalism of modern-day China is largely a creation of the Manchus, 300 or so years ago. But it, it has lived on into an era of forced integration that was not usually the Manchu way. Ruling as a small minority, a huge empire that they made bigger by conquest and alliance, the Manchus had to be clever and flexible. They seem to have understood their sovereignty as an ability to switch between and coordinate their different roles. Emperors in Beijing, Grand Khans in Mongolia, honorary lamas in Tibet. This channel switching ability is epitomized by the Qianlong Emperor who reigned from 1736 to 1796. Uh, there you go, a little note about, uh, about the puzzle of the Qing. But I really want to get onto the illustrations. Here is the Qianlong Emperor uh, presenting himself as a Buddhist uh, from Tibet, right? The costume and the hat are characteristically Tibetan, and specifically as the reincarnation of Manjusri, uh, a bodhisattva. Uh, this is also a piece of cultural hybridity because it follows the pattern of a Tibetan tanka painting. But the face was done by one of his Italian court painters, Giuseppe Castiglione. So, you know, it's really a wonderful salad of, uh, of different uh, identities and roles being played by uh, the emperor. Uh, and here is the same emperor, Qianlong, um, not very visible in the crowd, uh, but here he's playing his role as a Grand Khan. He's welcoming back the Torguts, who were a junior lineage of the Mongols who had taken refuge in Russia for several generations. They eventually came back, and he welcomed them in a huge ceremony with this enormous ceremonial yurt at his summer palace in Zheha. All right, so there's uh, the, uh, the Qianlong emperor. Uh, taking on another of his identities. Now, the Manchus had access to the Chinese world as bilinguals and as translators, and they participated in the other sub-areas of Zone C, Mongolia, Tibet, and Uyghurland, through ties of kinship, religion, or diplomacy. Uniformity of behavior and belief was irrelevant. Coordination was what, was, was what mattered, and that is what they were good at. Multilingualism and multiculturalism were for them not a matter of toleration, but rather an affirmed policy and a means of legitimation. The Manchus communicated with everybody. That was the key to their power. Their handling of the outlying areas recognized cultural, religious, and political difference in precisely the way that the present-day Chinese state, with its insistence on uniformity and assimilation, is reluctant to do. One example of the Manchu's strategy of multiple bilingualism makes a rare connection between the literary connection, traditions of Tibet and China. As usual, it is a clever and ambiguous one. In 1792, the Nepalese attacked Lhasa and were beaten back by a quickly summoned Manchu army of 70,000. Tibet, as you'll remember, had been under Qing military protection since 1721, and the Manchus professed fealty to the variant of Buddhism expounded by the Tibetan lamas. In commemoration of the victory, the Qianlong Emperor built a Chinese-style uh, here we go a Chinese-style temple on a spur of the same mountain where the Potala Palace stands in Lhasa. It's dedicated to Guan Yu, uh, to Guan Yu, sorry, the uh, the deified hero of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, a historical novel about the civil wars of the third century of our era. You often see this red-faced warrior in the corner of Chinese shops and businesses because he's become a kind of national protector figure, particularly for those living abroad. Now, Guan Yu has no meaning for Tibetans. The temple was designed for Chinese soldiers posted in Tibet, and the imperial inscription there memorializes the victory over the Nepalese as a Chinese victory. But the Manchus very cleverly designated it as a temple dedicated to Gesar as well. Gesar being the hero commemorated in that epic song you were hearing. 
And the Manchus referred to Gesar temples throughout Tibet as temples of Guandi, temples of Guanyu. One war god was equivalent to another, although the two individuals had lived at least a thousand years apart. Here, a bit of syncretism. Here's, by the way, uh, a recently erected statue of Guan Yu. So you can see there's still quite a lot of investment in this uh, warrior figure. Uh, one war god was equivalent to another, although the two individuals had lived at least a thousand years apart. Here, a bit of syncretism has been summoned up to paper over a long enduring rivalry. For Gesar, if you listen to his epic, frequently conducts raids on China sometimes in retribution for betrayal by Chinese leaders. Of course, no Chinese ever bothered to listen to the Gesar epic before modern times. This is Manchu multilingualism at work, fluent at changing registers and establishing equivalences, rather like the skills we stress in comparative literature. Today we see a China that's been incorporated into a different world one where the Europeans and North Americans have been the noisiest speakers, and where Chinese readers, writers, and textbook publishers have replaced their old literary world with a new world literature canon drawing on European, Russian, Japanese, and American primary texts. But like old foundations that can, that can be seen from the air, the organization of the literary world into its Chinese-speaking, Chinese character, and non-Chinese character zones remains and needs to be rediscovered. It's convenient for everybody to forget about the Manchus. They are among the unacknowledged makers of the modern world. They brought the Tibetans and Uyghurs into China, but did not demand the degree of integration and assimilation that those people are, according to present-day Han Chinese standards, failing to satisfy. Their empire was based on a model of the management of differences that an era of ethnically defined nations abandoned in favor of uniform and undivided sovereignty with only weak and symbolic protections for minorities. To frame a more truly cosmopolitan future for East Asian culture would be on the extreme ends of the consequences one might envision for this project, but I don't think it's impossible. And I wish to draw another lesson for culture and identity generally. When we speak of cosmopolitanism, a caveat is in order. No world culture or cosmopolitan sensibility is ever adequate to the term. The cosmopolises we can imagine always arise, it seems, in the shadow of an empire. Thus, when someone says world literature, it's important to ask which world, whose world, it is meant to be the literature of. That is to say, whose world order. There's the world order of the Mongols, the Manchus, medieval Christendom, of mercantilism, of the Berlin Conference, of the United Nations, and so on. Worlds are made, not found. They are often made by literary texts, which complicates the job of inserting the literature in the world when the opposite might be an easier fit. Moreover, a work may outlast the world it was made for. I'm a bit of a time traveler, and a traveler in space too, so it's essential to me to be able to switch among the different ways of ordering the world rather than accepting the present situation as the world. I myself confess an attachment to the world order proclaimed 70 years and one day ago, uh, there you go, 70 years and one day ago, uh, to be grounded in human rights is offering the best compromise between stability and autonomy and I hope it manages to weather all its current challenges, perhaps by returning to its founding documents. Thank you. It's interesting to, to look at contemporary China, if I may, mm -hmm. and, and the search to create a narrative for contemporary China, mm -hmm. which our the current leader, Mr. Xi Jinping, is, is, mm -hmm. is looking for. Um, and I'm wondering what you think of the attempts to craft this narrative now. A lot of it is, is, is predicated on, on an old vision of China, which is fine, it's a long mm. tradition. Um, and then there's a certain amount of definition of China against particularly the Japanese. Mm. And if you, watch Jap if you watch Chinese TV, endless numbers of soap operas about the, the war against Japan. Um, but there's, I'm wondering what's the core of that narrative as you see it in China today? What, 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 is, what are they... How are they trying to mm -hmm. proclaim Chineseness today as compared to the, the past version right. that we talked about? Right. Well, um, I think it's something we see in a lot of places, a, uh, a resurgence of a, a national triumphalist narrative. 
Uh, it takes particular forms in China, uh, some of them being kind of an exaggeration, I think. Uh, Chinese culture has to be 5,000 years old. Right? Only mm. a few years ago, people mm. were content with three or 4,000 years, and uh, now it's got to be 5,000 years. Um, and this is kind of lightly based in fact, right? I mean, there, there have been people living in China for a very long time. You have to have an optimistic reading of some pottery fragments to think that, that there's a lot of continuity with later Chinese culture. And also, all of the area of present-day China has always been part of China, right? So the, those things I was telling you about the 18th century conquests of the Manchus, you're not supposed to know that, right? right this is, right. Uh, and the fact of there having been Chinese presence in some of these areas is taken to mean that the whole thing was Chinese. And this, yeah, you know, these are signals saying that this is, this is a country that is feeling its oats and is ready to be in an expansive <laughs> mode. Um, but I don't know how much, uh, how much this is a, a useful mode of narrative, even for, for the Chinese polity. Right? Um, sooner or later, they're going to enter in, into frictions with their neighbors that will be uncomfortable for everybody, I'm sure. And, and also, there's just the constant stress of having to pile superlative on superlative to arrive at some final stage of exaggeration. So, I don't know, I think it's characteristic of, of an attempt to, to uh, also cover over divisions in society, right? Trying to, mm -hmm. trying to beat patriotic drums. And of course, antagonism toward the Japanese uh, is a reliable sentiment in China. The, uh, certainly, Chinese people have suffered a great deal at the hands of the Japanese in the, during the 20th century. And that's part of the foundation narrative of the Communist Party their participation in the, in the um, uh, war of resistance against Japan. So they're going to use that any way they can to achieve a kind of a forced unity. Mm -hmm. Let me now turn on his head, if I may, and uh, admire for a moment the incredible absorptive capacity of Chinese culture, mm -hmm. as far as we can mm -hmm. call it Chinese culture, because um, it wasn't just the Manchus, it was the Mongols also, mm -hmm. the Yuan dynasty, right. who were also invaders. Right. And I wonder, and I'm throwing something at you here, which I haven't warned you about, but I see some similarities there with the Persians, mm -hmm. the only culture in the Middle East that was turned into Islam but kept its own language. Mm -hmm. All the other countries there, they all mm -hmm. speak Arabic today, Persians speak Persian. They kept a lot more than their language. That, yeah. Indeed. And they, <laughs> but they had that same ability to take mm -hmm. invaders from the Arabs, they took the Russians, the Brits, everyone, mm -hmm. everyone through Persia, just mm -hmm. like China, and, and kept that culture. There's something yeah. magic about that, and I wonder yeah. what thoughts you might have about that in China's case. Sure. Well, it probably goes back to the fact that the Persian Empire was big and multicultural yeah. before multicultural was cool. Yeah. Right. If you remember uh, from from Sunday school, the Book of Esther. Right. You know, King ah Ahasuerus gets angry at his wife and sends a note to all of the men of 14 different nationalities, a note saying that a man must be the ruler in his own house. And it's a, it's a crazy, absurd kind of parody of something that was actually happening in Persia, which is that all the laws had to be translated into, you know, Parthian and Median and Sogdian and whatever. Right? That's, that's an experience that I think allows, allows for some flexibility. Yeah. And, and the analog with China then? This absorbed so, capacity they have. Um, yeah, China absorbed a lot, mm -hmm. right? Um, the question is, does the, does the dominant narrative of who the Chinese are allow for that absorption and diversity? So that's what we're trying to bring out in this, in right. this project mm -hmm. and recover you know, the, whatever um, traces of, let's say, the Yue or the Dongyi, you know, these long forgotten antagonists can still be seen in, in documents and building styles and other things. Right? And then I assume, well, I'm looking forward to, for example, the, the volume on Japan, mm. because so much of Japanese culture was taken from a particular time in China's history, by right. Tang Dynasty China. Right. Um, again, not that much acknowledged in, in, mm. in Japan. Um, how many volumes? Six? Yeah, we think six or seven. And how yeah. are you dividing it up? Uh, well, let's see. Um, there's got to be a volume about the... About the, uh, the amalgamation of, of different cultures within China, so a lot of archaeologists will be involved in that. 
Uh, there will, it's mostly going to be organized by communication networks. Mm -hmm. right? So there will be the, Central Asia, the period when the Central Asian communication network was the thing that brought everybody in East Asia into a kind of distanced conversation. Uh, the, the network fostered by Buddhist pilgrims mm -hmm. in another period. The sea, the sea routes that become very important and connect China with India and with the Arabic-speaking world and so on. So I think that's going to be the main articulating structure. And, of course, the one belt, one road, or however they call it now today, is, yeah. is a yeah. reiteration of that. Yeah. We have some questions in the audience. There's much smarter people here. Okay. Uh, could you speak of literature? Mm. Uh, well, we think of European literature, mm. poems and novels. Right. Uh, is, that, is that similar? Mm -hmm. And is it alike in the Chinese as well as in the vernacular mm. right. literature? Uh, or is that mm. recovering something entirely different from what we understand? Mm. Sure, we have uh, in, in Chinese you have a lot of the same genres, but there's a hierarchy of genres that's very marked in the, in the classical period. Remember, I'm a pre-1800 guy. So, uh, you know, poetry is at the top. Serious prose writing, including history and essays, comes next. And fiction is very, very low. No respectable person ever writes fiction. And this didn't keep the Chinese from writing some of the greatest novels in the history of the world, which are now considered classical Chinese literature. But if you'd asked a person from 1800, they would blush to admit that they read such scandalous things as you know, The Dream of the Red Chamber. You know, no one would, would possibly admit to reading that, but it's you know, one of the greatest books there is. So there's a hierarchy of genres that in the other countries that borrowed the Chinese character wasn't necessarily adopted, right? So vernacular fiction in Japan, for example, produces masterpieces that are early on recognized as masterpieces. Everybody reads the tale of Genji. It's illustrated, it becomes you know, the subject of countless fantasies by countless people. Uh, palace, whole imperial palaces are decorated with a Genji theme, which you wouldn't have quite had in, in China on account of that different relation among the genres. So, you know, the, the, um, the, the differences among the, patterns of uh, of, among the patterns of literary life in these cultures that are in communication uh, interests me, and also how much of the news of of one culture could and couldn't make its way over to another one. Okay. Yes, we go to the lady there and then we'll come here. Yes, right there. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Hon, I'm very happy and at the same time impressed you want to write a literary history and um, how, how oh, it's many. Old fashioned boys. genre. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I couldn't um, think of anything harder than that. Mm -hmm. But you showed the maps and you sort of given uh, four big areas like Mongolia, mm -hmm. other than Japan we heard mm -hmm. about, and then Tibet, and then Xinjiang, and then China. Now, how will you actually divide that? Because there, there are different ways. Uh, you could do mm -hmm. it, you know, geographically, you could, but there also has to be an internal cohesion to each mm -hmm. of these. You know, do they actually have their own literature and their own language? Do they have uh, a narrative? But then, even if they do have a narrative, you could mistrust that because it's sort of a counter-nationalism. Mm -hmm. And then you also, you mentioned the communication thing. So what is your, your way of organizing mm -hmm. your pan-Asian history. Right. We have to start out with the invention of writing systems. You know, silly though that may sound, it's, it's the place to begin. What gets written down, right? The first texts to be written down are not necessarily high literary texts, although you know, surprisingly quickly you get important literary texts in, in most of these languages. Um, who translates what? I think translation will necessarily be a really important thread to follow, right? Because a, that's inherently uh, a cross-cultural event, right? a cross-linguistic event, and B, it's, it's documentable. I, you, we could, you know, I wouldn't want to, to produce a bunch of books where people speculate vaguely about similarities between things, but when you can show that someone translated an item from another culture, that, that somehow seems to pin it down a little bit more. So that will... That will be the main thing. But as I say, most of the contributors wanted to write an essay about a specialized topic. So the hard thing is going to be to drag them into considering more generally what the pattern of the interchanges is. 
<coughs> I'm going to be learning from the contributors because they're the people who actually know stuff. I'm, I'm the person who's trying to put together the, the general picture from what they tell me. Hmm? <laughs> we had a gentleman down here in the front. I have a follow-up question to mm. uh, yeah. Mr. Schlendorf's question. Mm -hmm. um, you refer to uh, the hierarchy of genres in, in Chinese literature, mm -hmm. and uh, was this hierarchy also gendered? <coughs> the question I ask mm -hmm. is, is, you know, because I know from Japanese literature mm -hmm. that the fiction was an area mm -hmm. uh, by, by female writers. Right. Written in different so, characters, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, women's writing in, in hiragana is, that's one of the originalities of, of Japanese literature. You have women writers very early on in China, but they tended to be uh, of two types. Either they were courtesans, so they were writing poetry as one of the kinds of attractiveness that was part of their business, or they were very well-born women who benefited from the same education that their brothers had. And these two types of women were, were eager not to be mistaken for each other. <laughs> so there's a, kind of a, there's a kind of a conflict and rivalry that's built into the canon of women's literature. Uh, and uh, many men also wrote essays on women's education, uh, the message of which was usually, the less of it they have, the better. Right? So that any woman who wrote things was suspect. And um, Sun Kangyi and I edited a, a big anthology of women's writing from, from China before 1911. Mm -hmm. And one of the funniest things to, to read there was the prefaces of these wonderful collections of poetry by women. The preface always says, uh, this volume escaped my hands, it was not for circulation, not even my family was supposed to know about it, and someone stole it from me, and that's why it's being published. Right? <laughs> Which is a gesture that you also find in the Pillow Book of Seishonagon, and so on. So there's a kind of a, a bashfulness about writing that, uh, that goes with being female uh, in, in both those countries. But, but so, anyway, there was, there was a certainly a gendered thing, but also a, a class thing going on within the gender that creates a kind of a dynamic. Because, of course, although you wouldn't want anyone to think that you're a courtesan, you'd also want people to think that you write at least as well as a courtesan. Right? So <laughs> yeah. That adds some springiness to the situation. Yes, ma'am. So uh, thank you very much. It was a very interesting macro perspective cool. also on literature. And I think mm. it's very typical that we now shift from a national literature to a kind of imperial mm. literature, like mm. in history. And there yeah. was this kind of shift. Mm. And we have then problems like we, we don't speak about text, but now on shore, cultural contact and mm. languages, characters, mm. and all this kind of macro words. And we have a similar things in European literature when mm. we regard now Austrian Empire or the Russian Empire or the Ottoman Empire and right. to look about uh, the connections between the literatures mm. in this time. But I think um, we lack, and that's my question, mm. don't we lack a kind of appropriate language or theory for this kind of um, uh, description because we have, um, you spoke also of hybridity, multiculturalism, mm -hmm. multilingualism, um, mm -hmm. or also uh, minorities, a very mm -hmm. recent notion. Right. And mm -hmm. so, do you feel we have a, to use or to, to, to generate a kind of new theoretical framework or new words for this kind mm -hmm. of empire? studies and literary studies? Probably, yes. I, mean, I, I didn't feel very good about, uh, about saying how wonderful empires are because, of course, yeah. we know that, that they're, you know, they're not generally a good thing. Right? <laughs> empires are responsible for a lot of uh, death Special and destruction, piece. right? Yeah. Um, so, and yet, um, you know, the, the thing that was supposed to replace the empires, the Wilsonian model of, you know, a, of a homogeneous people within secure borders has not really worked out perfectly well either in the, in the course of the 20th century. Um, so that's, that's why I'm so fond of the Manchus, I guess. That's why they, they tend to surface as the, as the trickster heroes of this story because of their ability to, 
to harness difference and not enforce uniformity. In fact, to, to make difference the way things worked for them. The, uh, um, so there's, there's that. In fact, the comparative literature and empire go back quite a ways. Uh, people might remember Ernst Robert Curtius, you know, who's, uh, what is it, Europäische uh, Literatur und Lateinische Mittelalter, a book that we all got dragged through. Uh, it was well, well translated in the 50s and published by Princeton Press, so it was always on the shelf next to Auerbach's Mimesis. You know, these were the two obligatory books that you had to read. One taught you how to do literary history, the other one taught you how to do an analysis of textual passages. And Curtius's whole book is a kind of a nostalgic ode to the Roman Empire. Why can't we have Latinitas again? Uh, and since it was published in, I think, 1946 or 47, it strikes a very, very curious note, right? Uh, as, as if, you know, we've seen Europe tear itself apart. If only people had not <coughs> taken the path of nationalism, but had continued on the federative Roman style. That seems to be the argument of the book. So that, anyway, that, this is just to say that empires have been with us for a while. Uh, that one, that one being, being a Roman one. And since I think the book's greatest popularity was achieved in America, where people might have been just oblivious to some of the, some of the messages that Curtius was sending, it took a while for people to, to notice it. Right? But so yes, I think we do need a new language to talk about these things. And here I've found very useful uh, a, a book by Frederick Cooper and I've forgotten the other author. Uh, but, excuse me? Yes, yeah. Uh, which is an analysis of empires in terms of the techniques that they used. Right? So it just breaks them down into a sort of a toolkit and, and helps you understand them from that point of view. And perhaps, you know, it's, it's a technocratic vision of how empires work. And how the cultural piece goes with that is, you know, is not immediately obvious either. So thank you very much. That was a really wonderful talk. And I, I have two questions, I think. And the first one is, um, you know, you, you, you showed I think very convincingly that uh, you know imperial China or let's say you know the, your zone A, mm. right, didn't display much interest in the literature of zone C, mm. you know, mm. periphery or periphery is maybe also a problematic mm. word, um, and of course you know that point is well taken. But if we look at the entire sweep you know of Chinese history, mm. that seems not always have been the case. Right. So you know the examples. I mean, uh, definitely Indian. Right, literature. I mean, mm -hmm. all of course related to Buddhism, right. but I think one could also argue Islam, mm -hmm. Muslim literature, mm -hmm. Muslim texts circulated mm -hmm. widely in mm -hmm. China. There was a big interest in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we look at art, for instance, if we leave the realm of literature and go mm -hmm. to art, right? I mean, there is a huge interest, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, in earlier times during Tang Dynasty, but also later mm -hmm. in Indian art, but also Islamic art. Mm -hmm. You know, there's huge collections and even earlier and so on. So I wonder a little bit how we, you know, is there a certain discrepancy and how would you explain it? And my second question um, is a very simple one um, because you, of course, you, you showed us, you know, classical Chinese, mm -hmm. and you argued, of course, it's Chinese. Mm -hmm. Now the question would be, how Chinese is classical, really? Mm -hmm. I mean, you translated mm -hmm. at Hanwen, mm -hmm. right? But of course, you, you know, we also find Wen Yan, or, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's not entirely, you know, and when it was really in Zhou Dynasty, how Chinese was Zhou Dynasty? And yeah. earlier, and so on. They didn't right. know they were going to be Chinese. Ah, exactly. <laughs> they had no, <laughs> they idea. Had no idea. <laughs> how lucky they were. Right. <laughs> well, it's, it's certain that, yeah. Uh, um, you know, uh, there there were lots of texts circulating uh, in in China from other sources. There was interest in them. Uh, the the issue there is where do they fit in in what I'm calling the hierarchy of genres, right? Or how close could they come to official orthodoxy, which alas tended to have a dominant place in institutions like the exam system and you know, the compilation of histories and so on. Um, and many of these texts from outside would, would not always circulate in the same way. Right? 
they wouldn't attract commentaries, they wouldn't be studied in, in the way that you know, the canonical texts were. So I don't want to dismiss them at all, but I think we just need to describe how they got in and what they did when they, when they circulated and who was reading them. Right? Um, I find that it's often the, uh, the rebels and the renegades who, who are reading texts like that. And it's, we're very lucky that we have this marvelous find of Dunhuang, right, this collection of thousands of manuscripts sealed up in a cave around the year 1100 that shows us what people were reading very far from the official center of the country in an extremely multilingual community that was you know, definitely not representative of the kind of uh, um, uh, standardized version of the canon that, that I've been portraying here. But if it, if it hadn't been for that one cave full of documents, we might never have known about the things happening in Dunhuang. And so there, I guess, historical humility and knowing how much of the documentation has simply vanished is, is helpful. But yeah, the, it's, it's work that needs a lot of collaborators and you know, we don't, I think we don't want to, uh, we don't want to disregard what existed, but also we need to know how it existed and by whom it was carried where. How is mainland China going to react to your project? Well, you know, I think they'll be unhappy about many aspects of it. Um, again, because the, even, even people who, whom I consider very, very liberal and non-dogmatic uh, colleagues in China, you know, when, when we're talking about early China, uh, to, to make to them this point that the Zhou Chinese did not know that they were going to become the Chinese seems extremely perverted and counterintuitive, right? <laughs> because of course they were always going to become Chinese. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it, it, there's a kind of an instinctual way that, that uh, a, a sort of a, a teleology, right, a, a kind of a, a, a direction toward a goal is inscribed in the literary history that people read and, and study and are, are examined on that makes it hard to get rid of, right? I imagine, you know, you could say very similar things about American education, you know, the way that we react when people say, the founders did this or they did that, and we immediately take that to be, you know, a, an argument about authority and truth and wisdom and, and you know, good versus evil and so on, whereas you know, we know if we stand aside from that ideological constellation that we're born into, we say, well, yeah, the founders were, they were guys who wore wigs and they were mortal and they were wrong some of the time too. <laughs> but it's hard to have a discussion about the founders in America without all those assumptions about their, their amazing transcendent prudence and wisdom coming in and confusing the situation. So that's a, a bit long-winded of me, but that's that's the, you know, even, even among the people with whom I'm closest, I expect some resistance. <laughs> Sir, let me get to Rosalind behind you. He says, I'm Actually, I, my question ties in with uh, the one you asked at the mm -hmm. end. You showed us this one um, slide about um, showing just like the different circles and mm -hmm. uh, just like Chinese characters, Chinese script culture, mm -hmm. classical Chinese, moving out of China mm -hmm. to Japan, to Korea, mm -hmm. developing something new there and be mm -hmm. turning into something else. Mm -hmm. But the same could be uh, applied to China from within. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the same kind of just like hybridity within China. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when I look at uh, Zhuang, the Zhuang and their script and mm -hmm. uh, how it was like uh, adopted Chinese writing mm -hmm. traditions and turned into something new, but also within Sinitic languages, for example, mm -hmm. we got to look at uh, mean, mean language literature and the mm -hmm. history of it dating at least to the 17th century. Wow. So uh, I wonder if you could comment on this and also the notion that uh, like something like a, a coherent Chinese script and language culture actually didn't exist, mm -hmm. which would, would be also quite provocative against mm -hmm. um, for for Chinese yeah. people. To yeah. Live, to sure. Yeah, there there are lots of uh, lots of local scripts that are devised in response to to Chinese. I mean, the the Xixia, right? Mm -hmm. The Tangut had a, a fascinating script that looks rather Chinese, but is totally illegible and has has to be deciphered on in some way. You have the Nuosu, you have the the women's script in in Hunan. But uh, the curious thing is that I think generally uh, these are one-way paths, right? Something, something comes from Chinese script and goes into this local script and it doesn't then 
go back into the mainstream culture of China until the 20th century when we, when we have disciplines like ethnography and, and so on that, that create that, the conditions so that you can now buy a book in, in modern Chinese about you know, the women's script of Hunan or the Norsu or whatnot. But um, I think generally uh, the, you know, the medium of conversation was, was, was there. It was like a big public highway and if you were going on a byway you tended to you know, depart from it. But yeah, I you know, I'm, I'm I think that's a very good point though that the that this dynamic is not just a matter of inside and outside the boundaries of China. Right? Yeah. You had a Rosalind number of gentlemen in the back there. Thanks, Han. That was beautiful, and it's kind of not fair that you know so much. <laughs> I'm um, showing all my ignorance. Too. Uh, of course, it surprised me that then that you started off with a, a story from social media, and I thought, wow, mm. Han Saucy does social media too. He, he, doesn't, he never sleeps. Um, but that was a really interesting story, and it mm. threw me back to earlier work of my own about the moment in uh, Siam in the middle of the 19th century when the first mm. photograph of a Siamese monarch was taken. Mm. by John Thompson, mm. and when Mongkut agreed to pose after much persuasion, mm. he appeared and was wearing the costume of a French field marshal. And the photographer, John Thompson, said, I mean, how is anyone going to know that you're a Siamese monarch? I mean, this is not what a Siamese monarch looks like. And so eventually he persuaded him to put on royal regalia so that he could appear from outside mm. as the appropriately Siamese kind of person. And it seems like this question of what mm -hmm. does Chineseness look like, either in mm -hmm. its literary scriptural form or in its sartorial form, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the reason I raise this is not just because I have a story too, but because, of course, there was such a large population mm -hmm. of what gets called in Southeast Asia of straits Chinese mm -hmm. there. And I was just wondering mm -hmm. where that story, that diasporic mm -hmm seven centuries-ish long mm -hmm. history of what gets called Chinese mm -hmm. retrospectively and is working in a very different way, not as an absorptive kind of force, but as a kind of seeding mm -hmm. force, often fairly insular, but on mm -hmm. the other hand, disseminating literary cultures, practices of reading, scripts, mm -hmm. forms of administration, forms of business mm -hmm. organization, and so forth. Is that part of the story? Is that... Is that part of the empire story, the, and it is, the, out, I'll, the outward yeah. movement? Mm -hmm. it's, it's part of the story, and um, yeah, I'm lucky that one of the people whose dissertation I'm advising is, is writing about exactly this, and I've enthusiastically recruited him into the project, poor guy. Uh, but but this, is, this is what he's writing about. It's, uh, he's writing about Malaysia and Thailand and uh, Indonesia and what would become Singapore as places of settlement where people often... Uh, preserve you know, forms of, of lineage organization that then would later be abandoned by people on the mainland. Uh, the, you know, the, the Chinese empire for a long time was completely uninterested in these groups of Chinese who were abroad. Uh, when some of them were killed in a massacre, the, uh, I think it was the Kangxi emperor sent a little message that said, well, serves them right, they shouldn't have left China. And that was... Well, that would have been around 1710 or so, you know. There were long periods uh, when they couldn't go back, right? Right. Once right. you made that trip, you were, you yeah. were done. Right? Yeah. But one thing is that when people emigrated, they often became extremely rich. And also they were able to organize themselves in other ways. The, the revolution of 1911 was largely funded and organized by people outside the country, like Sun Yat-sen, who was from you know, Honolulu, a Cantonese who had grown up uh, outside the empire, uh, and and this is this is fascinating stuff because the uh, the the documents that my student has been able to uncover are are extremely rich and interesting and are often bilingual, uh, you know where there's a, a Malay text and a Chinese text addressing each other. Um, they are also often classical. You know, people, people in, in uh, Southeast Asia continued to use classical language after 1919 when people in, in China were discouraged from doing so. So he has many examples of people writing their diaries in classical Chinese up until the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there, there's a very interesting dynamic there, which has become 
part, uh, the center of a new subfield, which is called Sinophone Studies, right? the study of, of Chinese language literature outside of China and in some ways responding to China or being different from China. So some of that will go into the book, too. There's a gentleman in the back there. Okay, well, on the way back, sure. Go ahead, and then we'll do the gentleman in the back, sorry. Thank you so much for a fascinating uh, talk. Uh, and I think it's really important to have this kind of focus uh, to, to uh, correct the kind of image we have uh, from the West uh, onward mm -hmm. literature. Uh, I was wondering, so what you show really confirms the kind of observation that were done in sociology of translation by Johanne Brun, but about the mm -hmm. circulation across mm -hmm. languages, uh, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, dominant language export more than they import and mm -hmm. that the dominant language uh, mm -hmm. import more than they export um, and this can be observed in uh, other places, mm -hmm. uh, other moments. Uh, I was thinking of, uh, of the uh, communist regime uh, during uh, uh, the Soviet do domination where the, you can observe the same part pattern like uh, the imperial uh, mm -hmm. pattern. Uh, uh, but uh, my question was more about uh, space of circulation. Mm -hmm. So uh, is this space of circulation uh, regional or does it go beyond the region? Should we think about, uh, because there are a phenomenon of regionalization of circulation of uh, uh, literature, uh, how, do, how do we place this in the larger picture of the uh, word uh, literary, literary history and I would be totally re ready to revise all the kind of periodization we have, that, uh, which uh, always um, makes us think of the West as always having been dominant, which is, mm. I think, not true. And probably this dominance starts more in the 18th century. Uh, but how, how do you see this in the larger picture? Yeah. Well, um, big question. I mean, one, one thing is, uh, one of the things that makes this project fun for me is that I'm you know, a person who had a Eurocentric education, who later acquired a Sinocentric education and became dissatisfied with both forms of centrism. So in a way, the, it's, a, it's an attempt to find the, the examples and the exceptions that will persuade me out of those habits. Um, you know, there, there is a, um, you know, there, there are obviously uh, lots of, of problems with any narration that, that assumes that the, the important genre of world literature is already known, right? It's the novel. And the novel began in Europe in the 17th century, and then it was carried out to these other places who gratefully received it and began imitating it. I mean, alas, this is I'm summarizing several books by several extremely famous people who have persuaded millions of people around the world that this is the way li world literature works, right? So uh, in a way, it's just time to go back to the facts and say, okay, what were people doing with letters in other parts of the world? What did people think was important in 700 or, or in 1400 or in 1600? in a place where the European example had not yet arrived. Were they simply sitting on the ground wondering what to do with themselves? Well, of course not, right? And um, so, you know, they're, they're just interesting stories to tell that are different, right? Institutions are different. Uh, printing and publishing, obviously, an enormously different story, which you know, has its center in, uh, in China. Um, you know, a lot of the job is simply going to be uh, descriptive in nature. Right? So I can, I can maybe spare on the polemics. And uh, merely describing these other situations will, will I think, be enough to, to create some competition for the, the world literature narratives that are currently most popular. There's a gentleman in the back there. Yeah. Straight to the left there. there you go. Um, the lady before answered part of my question already. Yes. Uh, no, um, I wonder why you didn't mention the, minor, the smaller uh, Southeast Asian countries, for example, Thailand. Mm. And originally, about a thousand years ago, they um, emigrated. And uh, on the map, you saw, I was, I was wondering, uh, 
originally they, they came from the southern China border, from, from Yunnan, mm -hmm. the Thai people I was talking mm -hmm. now. And also, um, I could see it by the color, in the uh, more in the middle of uh, central China. Can you say something about how they, um, if they are related together, or uh, can you say something about these, uh, especially Thai people? Thank you. Right. Um, I, I don't know a lot about this. Um, a lot of my information about linguistic groups in China comes from Jerry Norman's book. Uh, I'm sorry, no, it's not Jerry Norman's book. He's got a book about Chinese, but it concentrates on Mandarin. It's Ramsey, thank you, thank you. Ramsey, Norman, you know, same number of syllables, uh, so they're the same guy. Uh, Robert Ramsey, The Languages of China, which you know, just sort of goes over everything. And yes, the, the, uh, the Dai people have, have tended to move around a bit in, in South China, and so some of them went north rather than going south. But yeah, and, and there's, uh, there's linguistic continuity there. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm afraid I just don't know very much. Uh, in fact, I don't know anything at all except for what I found in that very interesting source. So, so Ramsey is, is great. This gentleman here has his hand up. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this really amusing talk and a very informative talk. I have only a very short question. Mm -hmm. In this exchange of cultures, cultural traditions, mm -hmm. literary traditions, which role does do the performing arts play? Mm -hmm. Opera, theater, um, mm -hmm. these people, these were migrating mm -hmm. groups who one would mm -hmm. assume transported mm -hmm. certain stories from one place to another. Uh, uh, did you reserve a little mm -hmm. corner in these seven volume uh, edition to the performing <laughs> Arts. Yes, there, there, there needs to be uh, a lot about performing arts because not everybody was literate, but everybody went to the theater, right? And Chinese theater, which is usually sung and is performed on festival days in public places, and also takes the form of puppet shows and calendar pictures and carvings on, you know, on walls of temples and so on. It's omnipresent. You, you can't move in China without seeing performing art in some way or other. Uh, so yes, it's got to be there. And um, it's, it's related to, uh, to, um, to performance traditions of, for example, uh, Buddhist sermonizers who would go from place to place illustrating their talks with uh, scrolls that had pictures on them. Uh, Victor Mayer has done a terrific work on these bin one, as they're called, transformation tales. And he's got a very ambitious story about how this genre of illustrated scroll story begins in India and wanders around the world. He's got some nice maps, too. I wish I had his maps. Uh, but anyway, one, one performance genre among others. But I was, I was lucky to study with Jacques Pampano in Paris, who is one of the omnivorous consumers of Chinese performing art. And he, he took us through everything, everything from, you know, from shadow puppets to to opera performances. So that, that needs to be a big part of the, of the book. And I, I need to find someone competent to write it. Maybe I can persuade Monsieur Pampano to come and do a turn for us. Was there somebody at the back there? Yes, thank you. Perhaps it's interesting for you to, do you know that Eric Auerbach, when he was in Turkey for mm -hmm. 10 years or so, mm -hmm. uh, uh, was, was very interested in Turkish puppet theater, hmm. which is Karagos theater, which comes, right. of course, right. from Central yeah. Asian traditions. Right. No, no, yeah. I mean, this is a joke. Yeah. It's one of the few things the Greeks and Turks can agree on, right? <laughs> Karagos is in Karagos. Yeah. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Sir. Um, you mentioned that at the same time the southeast uh, of China, um, sorry, but yeah, that that is uh, Japan and uh, and Korea. They would participate in this in this um, examination system. I wonder if under the Manchu, the Zone C mm. countries, did they have the chance to participate mm -hmm. too? Yeah, yeah. Um, the 
uh, I, I'm really sounding like a, a press agent for the Manchus tonight, but <laughs> one of the fascinating thing about the Manchus is that from being nomadic people in the years before the 16th century, very early in the 17th century, they, they got themselves organized and they decided to begin conquering China. One of the things they did was hire some literati to come to Manchuria and translate Chinese classical texts into Manchurian. For that, they had to adapt the Mongolian alphabet and create a new writing. Uh, they, there was a, a, big, uh, a big effort to internalize Chinese culture before they internalized China, as it were. Uh, and what's astonishing about it is how, how quickly and, and how effectively this initiative took place. Um, I think literally within just a few decades. Um, there's also something that I learned from reading uh, Peter Kornitsky's book about uh, scripts in his East Asia, that uh, when embassies from Korea or Japan or other places visited China, uh, well, I guess Korea more often than Japan, um, the, uh, as they were exiting the country, they would be searched to make sure that they were not carrying works of history with them. It was okay to export books of philosophy because they talked broadly and in uh, schematic terms about the way the world was organized. But if you had Chinese history, you really knew how things worked. And this could be used against the, the Chinese. It was considered sensitive intelligence. And the Koreans kept on asking the, the court, will you please let us take away the Chinese histories? And in some cases, they relented. And there's a famous memo from Su Dongpo in the 12th century who's very angry that somebody else has agreed to, you know, one of his superiors in the administration has agreed to let the Koreans have some history. And he says, we're going to suffer for this. You'll see. So anyway, but the Manchus, I think, were aware of this and, and were definitely eager to... Yeah. Yeah. In the powers to Tibet and, and um, Mongolia during that time? Uh, they were, yeah, they were, there was a, a lot of, uh, of exchange. I think the, the Manchus were in much closer exchange with Mongolia and Tibet than, than with China. I mean, the nation system, was it open to Mongolians and to, to Tibetans? And the, yeah, they, um, the, the Manchus married into Mongolian lineages. Uh, in, you know, earlier they were known as the Jin or as the, the Jurchen, right, the Nujen, and it was only around 1600 that they renamed themselves Manchu, and for a long time they were just considered a kind of a subordinate line of the, of the Yuan, of the Mongols, but uh, they, they sort of reorganized their place in the world. And yeah, Pamela Crossley is my is my historical source for for a lot of this. Well, um, hmm? can I ask again about okay, the cave? Okay. I'm so intrigued by your cave. Oh, the the Dunhuang cave. Yes. This is one of the wonders of humanity. I'll I'll send you some <laughs> some stuff about it. This is wonderful website. Yeah. It is a wonderful website of the International Dunhuang Project that, uh, that gives the uh, digitizations of many of these scrolls, including illustrations and so on. There are bilingual scrolls, there are, there are Manichaean texts, there are Sogdian and Farsi and every imaginable language. Uh, and um, the, the, the scrolls were discovered around 1900 and immediately the English, the French, and Germans sent uh, these swashbuckling explorers off to the desert to get as many of them as they could. And so Sir Aurel Stein brought them to the British Museum, Paul Pelliot took them to, to Paris, and Albert von Lecoq brought them to Berlin. And since, the international project has been digitizing these and bringing them back together. Right? So, although no one's giving up their ill-gotten goods. They're at least digitizing them and making them available for, for everyone. But it's, it's fascinating material. You could spend your life reading the contents of that cave. Well, Hong, thank you. Yes. Oh, International Dunhuang Project, uh, D-U-N-H-U-A-N-G. 
A-N-G, and I believe you can find it under IDP.org. <coughs> mm -hmm. It's uh, run from, by the British Library. The lady in the British mm -hmm. Library, yeah. 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 Um, yes? Why was it warranted? Why was it all uh, preserved? What was the... <coughs> A mystery. Idea. Probably uh, somebody got wind that an invasion was imminent and decided to preserve all the best scrolls and just bricked up this cave and made it look innocuous. And it was then another 900 years before someone opened it. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for that wonderful display of intellectual pyrotechnics. A perfect way to end our year. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank it you was, all. It was nothing next to the turkey pile of puppets in Rival. Thank you, Tor. That was fantastic. Hold on.